God, thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is life. And, uh, and your word, your very word brings breath. It brings life to us. God, we ask that you would uh, right now speak into our hearts at the very deepest part of us, whatever it is that you want to say to us tonight, that we would hear you, that we would uh, turn off the noise, and that we would hear you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Tonight's message, what are you looking for? 1 Samuel 12, what are you looking for? We've been going through the book of Samuel, and uh, interesting book, because it's, yes, it's about this guy Samuel, but mostly it's about the establishment of the kings. Really, the, the book of Samuel is the transition from the judges to the kings. And uh, the last couple weeks, we looked at the fact that the people, um, Samuel had been leading, but his sons uh, were going to take over because he was getting old, but they didn't like the sons because the sons were not just. The sons were not following after their dad. And so they said, we want a king. We want a king like the other nations. We want to be like everybody else, basically. And God was not excited about that because he was their king. They thought they needed a king and they already had a king. What are you looking for? They decided, uh, the, the Lord led them to, to, to anoint Saul and Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was literally a whole head taller than everyone. He was the perfect guy. He was GQ. He was exactly what they were looking for. They anointed him as king and then they had their battles and Saul stepped up and led them in battle. And last, last week, Pastor Dave led a, a message on uh, the, um, uh, really? He, he, the, the message was, um, when the enemy comes in like a flood, and a powerful, powerful message in how the enemy just tries to attack, attack and overwhelm us, and actually really appropriate, fitting in with our stronghold message, stronghold series. So, um, these people cry out, they use Saul, Saul's used to bring victory, and the people are celebrating. We pick up actually in 1 Samuel 11, verse 14. And Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and they made Saul king before them, before the Lord in Gilgal. There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Okay, they win the battle. This is now, they've been in the promised land 400 years. It's been on again, off again, on again, off again, because they would follow the Lord, and then they would kind of wander away from the Lord, and then they would go into captivity, and then they would realize, oh, we're so stupid, we need the Lord. And they would come back to the Lord, and they would follow the Lord, and then they would kind of go back to their old ways, and then eventually they're back in captivity, and they'd cry out for another, another hero, and it would be Samson, or it would be Jephthah, or it would be these different guys that would come, and the Lord would raise up and would bring them victory, and then they would come back to the Lord. Here, now they've come back to the Lord, and Saul has led them in victory. Remember what was happening? The enemy was coming in like a flood and saying, if you don't follow me, I'm going to gouge out your right eye. Um, and and here's, here's, I'm going to wipe out your people, or you can make a treaty with me, a satanic treaty, and a gouge out your right eye. Hmm. Death or loss of sight? Which one would you choose? Most people are like, uh, is there a middle choice? Is there something in the middle? Is there another option? And that's what they said. You know what? Hey, let us see if there's another option. We're going to send, or give us a week to think about this choice. And, and they, the Lord showed up and brought Saul to bring the people. 100,000 people came out to fight and to, to wipe out the enemy. And so the people rejoiced greatly. Well, that takes us now to, they go to Gilgal to reestablish the kingdom, basically to, to coronate the coronation ceremony of Saul. Okay, this, is, this is a big deal. They just had a huge victory. They've already anointed Saul, but now it's going to be the coronation. Now it's going to be the chance to say, here's our guy. And they do it. And there's celebration. There's a party. And Samuel steps up. Samuel's old. And he steps up and he says, I have one last thing to say. Remember, Samuel has been the guy that had been the leader. And he's going to pass the mantle. Watch how he passes the mantle. 1 Samuel 12, verse 1. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now here's the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed, and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand 
have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. Samuel, he's basically, he's retiring and he's saying, hey, does anybody have anything against me? Here's the option. Have I done anything to cheat you? Have I ever stolen anything? Anybody, anybody? Everybody's like, no. Remember, his sons, his sons had done that. But for him, himself, no. He hadn't done any of that. And so he's saying, hey, listen, have I cheated in any way? I will restore it right now. Verse four, and they said, you've not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. He says, basically saying, don't come back and change your mind. Here was your chance. And the Lord is the witness saying, yes, okay, we agree. It's a reminder too that uh, God is a witness. God's a, a reminder that God sees everything, every vow that we make. Uh, sometimes the Promise Keeper movement was a huge thing, you know, what, 20 years ago now. And um, some of the, the, the people that spoke against it were speaking against it because guys were standing up and taking a vow, but they weren't necessarily serious about the vow. In fact, what would happen is there would be a, a men's conference, there would be a Promise Keeper's conference, and the, the hotels would tell you that the, the amount of porn that was watched during the Promise Keeper's conference was higher than the normal. What? Because we like to say the right thing, but to do the right thing is a whole lot harder. Say it or do it. And that was the, that was the challenge of Promise Keepers, getting a lot of people to say the promise, but it's a whole lot harder to live the promise. Well, verse six, then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. Samuel's here, he's going through this list of deliverers. He's saying, you know, you guys were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. Okay, you went into Egypt. Basically, Jacob brought the people into Egypt because of the famine. They were there for 400 years. At the end of 400 years, God brings a deliverer, Moses and Aaron. They they take them to the promised land. Joshua takes them through the promised land, conquering the promised land. It's been almost 400 years again, and they're crying for a deliverer. They're crying for a king to lead them. Verse 9, and when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the armor of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, but now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbaal, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt in safety. Basically, as I said, they wandered away, and God brought them Jerubbaal, which is the the, the kind of the victorious name of Gideon, okay? Basically, making a fool of Baal um, was was his name. And then Bedan, which was another name for Barak, speaking of Barak and Deborah. And then Jephthah and Samuel, these different leaders, these different judges that God brought to bring deliverance. God was always there. God was always on their side and always had somebody, if they just simply turned to him, but it was noticed it was a generation of flip-flopping, back and forth. One generation follows, the next forgets. Today I was um, taking a, running some errands with my son, one of my sons, and he, he was six, year old, six years old, and we were going to the bank. And we've been to the bank a bunch of times. And so this, here's how it works. We, you know, we get out of the car, he follows me into the bank, he, gets, uh, he, he waits patiently, and at the end they give him a lollipop. Okay, that's, that's the routine, okay? And he knows, I said we're going to the bank, he's like, oh, I get a lollipop. That's all he cares about. All right, so we get to the bank, and we've done this multiple times. You know, we get out, okay, so I, I'm, I'm in a hurry. So I get out of the bank, I get out of the car, and I start walking around, and I go up, and I look. He's not behind me. Where'd he go? And of course, he, he's at the bank, but he found something else. Oh, he's kind of trying to walk on the, 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 uh, the, the, the parking things. You know, he's walking on the parking things, and he's going the other, whoa, 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 Ethan, come here, come here, come here. Where are you going? We're going to the bank. Oh, oh, Okay. And it reminded me, it's like, we've been to the bank, we've done the routine multiple times, and I thought he had it. You just follow me. He found something else that was kind of fun. And he was doing the fun thing. And that's the same thing with our kids, all of our kids, generation to generation. You may follow the Lord, but what's going to go with your kids? We think that they're following us. And a lot of times they are. You know, I, we have a, a two-year-old foster 
daughter that's with us. And anything I say, she says right back, you know, good, bad, or otherwise. And so she's constantly saying things, and, and, and Brody will say something, and Ethan will say, and, and she's just imitating everybody, anything. In fact, if, he, if Brody goes like this, she goes, you know, she doesn't know what it means. She doesn't know anything. She just, all she does is whatever, we, whatever she sees, she does at two. Now it goes six to seven, huh, ain't happening anymore. They got, they got a mind of their own. They're following their own thing. They're going their own way. The challenge is we think that they're following us because we've done this so many times. They know. They know what they're doing. And then we look back, and they're not there. And that was the problem with Israel is that one generation follows, the next one forgets. One generation follows, the next one forgets. And that's why they kept going back and forth. They kept going back and forth. And so the Israelites said, we've got a solution. This heavenly king thing doesn't work because we can't see him. But if we had a permanent king, then we'd all follow. We'd all follow. Hmm. Verse 12. When you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. So many people are looking for something that they already have. It's one of Satan's biggest temptations. On the screen, you have uh, Genesis 3. You guys know the passage. Um, This is uh, the temptation, the fall, and um, the serpent's more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. On the next screen. There we go. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, Satan's biggest lie is always to sell us something that we already have. The first lie is, you know, there's a couple different things. No, 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 back, go back. The first lie is, is to see, um, is, is Satan saying, the first lie is, well, hey, did God say you can't eat of any tree? He can't, you can't eat of any of these trees? He's twisted it. There's only one tree that they can't eat it, but Satan just twisted it a little bit. You can't eat any of these trees? Oh, no, 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 We can eat, of all the trees, just this one. Oh, but God's holding out on you because if you eat of that one, you'll be like God. So the first thing is, the first lie is that God is not good. See, Satan's good because he's telling you the truth. Satan's telling you the truth because the truth is that if you eat of this, you'll be like God. In other words, you'll get something because God's trying to hold out. He doesn't want you to have everything. He really doesn't love you that much. He loves you, but he doesn't love you that much. And that's the first lie. And Satan lies to us repeatedly about that. Maybe, well, I know Satan, I know that God loves the world, and he loves me, but he doesn't love me as much as he loves Pastor Dave. Because anything that Pastor Dave does just happens. It's just, just God shows up. Right? It's just that there's just a sense of like, well, whatever he touches is just whoosh. Jesus loves him most. And that's what sometimes we have that feeling. Sometimes we think that. And Satan is throwing us that lie. That's the first lie, is that God is not good. The second lie is that God is not good enough. God's not good. In other words, he's not really completely good. He's holding back. Or he's not good enough. In other words, he's not enough to meet all your needs. You need something more. Either God's not good or he's not good enough. See, in the, um, in the garden, the temptation was you will become like God. Satan's trying to t- sell Eve something she already has. She was made in the image of God. She already was like God. And Satan's going to try to tell her, you don't have this, but let me sell it to you. Wow. And she bought it. And we think that we're, well, we're more sophisticated. Genetically, she was sharper and brighter than you are. All right? So if, if anybody had a chance, she did. Satan was deceptive. Satan knew that he could just twist things and he could just, just distort things, just, just make God out to be maybe, you know what, if I can twist the way you view the past, I might be able to control your future. 
That's what Satan does. He twists our view of the past to try to control our future. I'm looking back and God says, don't eat of this tree. Satan twists it and says, yeah, that's because he's holding out. No, he's actually trying to protect you. Satan twists. Is God good or is he good enough? Well, here the Israelites are falling for those lies. They're falling for some of those problems. It reminds me of the, of the situation, the story of um, William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst was a media mogul back in the early part of the 19th century. This guy was basically was a net worth of half a billion dollars, okay, uh, in today's money. Um, huge, hugely wealthy. He basically controlled 30 different newspapers in terms of control of the media. He was the guy. He was also a huge art collector. He had a, a ranch that was uh, 240,000 acres, okay? That is a big ranch. My parents have a big ranch it doesn't even come close to that. Okay, 240,000 acres. That's basically the land, that's the, the, the um, if you take Palm Beach County and, and just take the developed part of Palm Beach County, that's basically Palm Beach County, okay? The developed part. Um, and uh, so he had uh, an affinity for art and he loved to collect art. He just had to have lots of art. And um, he, found, he was reading in the magazine one day about this beautiful piece of art, and he, and he saw a, a color photograph of it. He said, I have to have that. And so he called his agent and said, I need this piece of art. Find it. Whatever you do, find this piece of art for me. And this agent spends months looking, and, and goes to New York, and, and goes to Chicago, and Toronto, and Washington, D.C., and Buenos Aires, Los, Los Angeles, all over searching on different leads, trying to find this one piece of art. Can't find it. Hearst, who's megalomaniac here, he, he doesn't tolerate incompetency and immediately fires him. He hires a detective agency, and this detective agency um, begins searching, and they search all over Europe, and they go to um, Lisbon and, and um, um, London, Paris, Prague, Oslo, all these different galleries throughout Europe trying to find this, you know, following this lead and this lead and this lead, and they come back after months and say, sir, we can't find it. Frustrated, he, he, he fires them, and he takes one of the detectives from this agency and says, you find it, no matter what the cost, I want, a, I want this piece of art. This guy begins several months um, continuing to, to search and search and search and, and all over the world. Hearst has spent over $100,000 in two years searching for this piece of art. And the, the man finds it. And he comes to Hearst and he says, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is this piece of art is in excellent, it's mint condition. Hearst is like, whoa, what could be bad news? You already own it. It's in your, it's in your warehouse six miles down the road. He had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of his money and his time searching after this piece of art that he had to have that he already had. How many Christians are the same way? That we're looking and searching for that one thing when we already have that one thing. We're looking and we're searching, we're trying to, we're striving after this, we're striving after that, and God has already given you the kingdom. God has already given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. God has given you everything according to your needs in Christ Jesus. What are you looking for? Is it possible that you already have it in Jesus? Uh, that's why this prayer in, uh, on the next screen, Ephesians 1.18, uh, is a great prayer. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? What a prayer. You want to pray a blessing over something? That their eyes would be open that they could see what they already have. What do you have in Jesus Christ? That your eyes will be open to know the, the hope to which he's called to the riches of the glories of his inheritance, the hope that you have. To know the hope, to know the inheritance that you have. Most Christians live as paupers even though they're, son, they're children of the king. That's the way most Christians live because they don't appropriate the promises. They don't take possession of them. Are you looking for a mate? Maybe Jesus wants to take you deeper so that you're satisfied in him first. And when you're satisfied in him, you know, the, the, the challenge for most people is they're, just, they're trying to find a mate to make them complete. And yet two, you know, one plus one equals two, right? And in marriage, it's one plus one equals one marriage. But what the problem is, in most cases, it's you're not really a whole person yet. You're not healed. You're not whole in yourself. So it's really less than one plus less than one is disaster. 
That's really what it is. If, if you're not whole, if you're not right with the Lord, and you marry somebody else that's not right, then you just have... Mm, 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 mm. That's, what, that's the result. Less than one plus less than one equals definitely less than one. And that's what most people, they're looking, they're thinking that if I just found the right guy, if I just found the right girl, my life would be complete. And Jesus is saying, no, you need to find me, and I'm already right here. I'm not lost. You are. Are you looking for a new job? Maybe God is helping you identify with the fellowship of his sufferings so that you can be more like Jesus. Are you looking for more money? Maybe God is trying to teach you to seek riches in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy. Are you looking for healing? Maybe God is allowing the pain or the sickness to remain so that you can, he can take you deeper and to realize that happiness and contentment is not based on health, but trusting God in the midst of pain. I mean, you ask people, how are you doing? I'm good. Oh, you got your health? Yeah, you got your health. You got everything. No. You can be, got your health and be headed to hell. Do you have Jesus? Then you have everything. Some people are saying, well, I just need a new church. I just need, you know, this, this one's not working for me. Maybe God wants to grow character in you to teach you how to handle conflict so that you're not used by the enemy to gossip and slander and tear your brothers down and sisters down in Christ. So often we, you know, we, we have it all the time. People come to reveal and, and they're bad mouth in their old church and blah, 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 man, I can't believe they do, how they do things there. And just like, and we're thinking, I shouldn't tell you what we're thinking. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the problem is the person has so much dysfunction because they're so upset. And I understand there's, every church has dysfunction, okay? That's part of the reason we have a family meeting so that we can communicate, that we can talk. You know, every, every once in a while, my wife says, we need to talk. And I know that that means, oh, I'm like, what does that mean? What does, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, and what that means is we need to talk because Lots of times we're so busy, we're, we're so busy going, 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 going that we don't communicate. And because we don't communicate, if we don't redirect and recorrect our direction, we're going to get off. And so that's why we need to talk. And that's what our family meeting's about. It's about talking. It's about having communication. It's about asking questions and understanding and being on the same page. Well, most people, if they're coming from a church that they're unhappy with and they're pointing fingers, Really, remember, you're pointing a finger at somebody else. You've got three fingers pointing back at you. There's discontent. There's, there's gossip. There's slander that's going on. And so part of me, when, you, when I hear that, it's like, you know, I pray that the Lord would take you through that. And, we, and usually what Dave and I would do is kind of encourage them to go back and deal with it biblically. Matthew 18. You go to the person that offended you. You don't go to all the other churches. You don't go to all the other people in the congregation. You go to the person that offended you or that upsets you, and deal with the thing instead of trying to go to someplace else. Anyway, point being, what are you looking for? Is God already given it to you in Christ Jesus? Much of the time, he has. That's what had happened with the Israelites. He was already their king, but they were looking for a king. They already had one. They already had the perfect king. And we looked at that a couple chapters ago, um, that a new king would be totally different and would would take, would take, would take. And Pastor Jacob's message from a couple weeks back, you need to listen to, about kings. They take, they take, they take. But our King Jesus, he gives, and he gave that we might have life. So verse 13, 1 Samuel 12. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. Did you, hear, did you just read what I just read? If you obey and you follow the Lord, then you will continue and so will your king. That's weird. In other words, if the congregation or if the people, if the, if the nation continues to follow the Lord, then the leaders would. So what does that say if the leader's not following the Lord? And it's the people are not following the Lord. So often we can get so upset at our government and what's happening here in Florida and what's happening in the United States and what's happening, all these things. And basically, God gives people, God gives nations the leaders that they desire. That's why they got Saul, because they wanted somebody that was tall, that was majestic, and that could conquer. They wanted a king. 
They were looking out on the outside. So many times, that's what we, you know, we, we think that, you know, <laughs> here in the United States, we truly have that democratic process or republic or whatever you want, however you want to think about it, where we actually get to vote. We get the leaders that we want. And you say, well, I didn't vote for that leader. Okay, but as a nation, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. And so instead of complaining, what's the biblical response? To point fingers and to, to, to call down um, fire on Washington or Tallahassee or... Is that, what, is, that what, is that the example that we see in the scriptures? James and John wanted to do that, but God or Jesus rebuked them. Instead, what we see is, is uh, in Chronicles... If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, not hurl insults, not call fire down, not do all these things. If my people will humble themselves, then I will heal their land, then I will return. And they pray and seek my face. You know the verse. The whole point is we get so upset and we get so busy calling out things and God's calling us out. And he says, hey, you got what you asked for. Verse 15, however, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. In other words, if you rebel, you're going to get spanked. Verse 16, now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Okay, we often just read past this. It's like, okay, they're upset. Um, Samuel basically is rebuking them. He's in their face saying, you guys shouldn't have asked for a king. I can't believe you asked for a king. That's weird, because they just had this huge victory. They just defeated their enemy, the Ammonites. And yet, Samuel's rebuking them because their hearts were getting puffed up with, hey, we're good, we're good. So they had to get a little spanking here to, to, to wake them up, chastisement to wake them up. And then Samuel says, just so, in case, just so that you're listening, just so that, you're, that you really hear what I'm saying, and that, that the Lord is saying that, and it's not just me. Do you see that it's the wheat harvest? Okay, the wheat harvest um, was early in the summer. It was a dry time. And the, the wheat, the way wheat is, you have to have, the, the wheat has to dry out, okay? So the sun has to bake it, you know, we golden amber waves of grain you know that right okay that america or whatever it is so what happens is my um my parents were uh, farmers and so we we did um we did wheat harvest and what happened is we had to wait and we we prayed that it would not rain during the wheat you do not want rain during the harvest because you have to wait till it dries completely dries and then boom you got to come in and harvest it and what happens is if it rains, two things could, could happen. If it rains, um, you have to wait till it dries out again, number one. But also if you harvest it and it's even a little bit damp, it can rot, okay? The other thing is out there uh, when, it, when it's dry like that because it's, you're waiting for it to dry so much, uh, you have rain. It also says that there was thunder. Well, thunder means there's lightning. And lightning means that there's lightning hitting the ground. And lightning hitting the ground when there's dry wheat means fire. So here's their sustenance. Here's their whole livelihood, their whole economy. And Samuel says, in case you don't believe me, here's a little wake-up call. Boom. Rain, lightning, and the people are like, ah. They immediately repent. They realize, wow, God is serious. God is serious. And their response, verse 22, or verse 19. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. And Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. So here's the, a couple things. Um, Samuel says, hey, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm praying for you. And, and they, they repent. But he says, there's the temptation to follow empty things. And in our society today, man, our society is filled with lots of empty things that you can follow. There are so many things. I mean, the average American spends 33 hours in front of a box. (laughs) 
and all they all we do is flicking channels. 33 hours, that is almost a full-time job watching TV. Empty things. It's empty. It's an illusion. It's just it's just pictures. Or Xbox or Wii or you know whatever game system. Talk about empty things. And then there's not there's nothing wrong with a little bit of TV. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And but there's a lot of things that become more than a little bit in people's lives. And the result is it's empty things. And we start following these empty things and we start giving ourselves to these empty things. And then we say, Well, I don't have time. I don't feel any too tired to to, to read the Bible, but uh, maybe I can get on Xbox Live and play with my friends. Um, that'll be that'll wake me up. Or or maybe I can and, and we Man, I just want to, you know, I just need to chill and watch TV. I just, oh, oh, my show's on. Oh, okay. And then that show, what's the next one? Oh, that doesn't look good. Is there anything else on? And three hours later, three hours that could have been spent with the Lord. Empty things. We have so many empty, it's not wrong. I'm not saying if you watch TV at all, you're a sinner. Yes. Um, I'm saying, just kidding. If you watch, there's nothing wrong with watching TV, but is it an empty thing? Is it something that's controlling your life? Is it something that's pulled you out of where God wants you? Are you turning aside to empty things which cannot profit or cannot deliver? Sorry, Oprah, Dr. Oz, they cannot deliver. Um, now, maybe not just TVs, maybe not just a screen, maybe you have a hobby, um, sports, foot bail, super bail, all those things. Um, deflate gate um there's all these things talk about empty things <laughs> deflate gate empty thing. anyway okay some of you just that went that just went right over your head um does it consume you it's an empty thing verse 22 for the lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it has pleased the lord to make you his people this is probably one of the best verses in this, in this passage. The verse, okay, the people realize we've messed up. God, I'm sorry, we've messed up. And God is saying, the Lord will not forsake his people. He still loves you. You may think that, ah, oh, oh, I messed up. I married the wrong person. God says, it's okay. I still love you. And I'm going to walk you through this. Okay, but Lord, I want to repent now. God's like, <laughs> this is part of how I'm going to work Jesus in you. Yeah. But, but Lord, I messed up and, I, and I, I fell back into my sin. I did my, that thing that I just, that's been controlling. And God says, I still love you. Satan wants to come and say, yeah, but he doesn't love you as much as he used to. That's a lie. It's a lie. He still loves you. He, you are his people. If he loves Israel and Israel forsook him so many times and he continues to love Israel, he continues to love you. It doesn't matter how badly you've messed up. It doesn't matter how badly. I was talking with a young believer, a young brother, and he was saying, well, you know, but I'm a Christian and now that I've fallen back, I think I've lost my salvation. Well, the point is the, the fact that you're concerned about it means just means repent and turn to the Lord and you don't have to worry about losing your salvation because you didn't lose your salvation because if you're really saved, Jesus is the one who saved you. Um, but the, the, the point being, I don't know what the point being. Um, <laughs> don't know where I was going with that. Uh, I was, I was, tur I was you know, anyway, zoom, zoom, squirrel. Now, <laughs> point being, we are never beyond God's love. We're never beyond his reach. He continues to reach out to us even when we've totally messed up. And so we may think that, well, you know, I, 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 I'm a Christian now and so I need to walk perfect. Who told you that? We need to seek God and as you seek God, he will empower you to walk perfect but so many Christians are with this heavy yoke. Man, I gotta walk. I gotta walk like Jesus walked and so this cross is heavy. That's not what Jesus meant by walking like Jesus walked. It meant that walk in the power of the Spirit, and as a result, you, you, will, you will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not grow faint if you run in the power of the Spirit. But if you run in your power, you're going to run on empty, and you're going to be bummed, and you're going to be like, this, this Christian walk is hard because you're trying to do it in your own strength, and you can't. The, uh, we sang it tonight, that song, One Thing Remains, on the next screen. 
higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change, one thing remains. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. This is one of the songs that I, I've sung with my boys because I want them to have internalized this song. Your love never runs out on me. And so when you're, when you're in the midst of sin and the Lord just brings that to mind, it's like, ah, I'm going to go the other direction. When you're in the midst of brokenness and thinking, God, I, I, I failed you. I, I did it again. I'm sorry. Your love never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Wow. We need to be reminded. That's why we sing these songs, is to get them in our heads so it becomes part of us. It goes from here to here to here. It goes from our head to our hearts into our hands, and that is just a a total act of worship unto the Lord. His love, on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I never, ever have to be afraid. Be afraid of what? Be afraid that he doesn't love you. Be afraid that he's given up on you. Be afraid that he's left you. Never, ever have to be afraid of that. And then the bridge, in death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Like, it's practically taken right out of Romans 8. Wow. Wow. Well, let's finish up the, the chapter. Verse 23. Moreover, this is Samuel speaking. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. That warning at the end is not God saying, but I'm going to jerk back my promise. No, he's saying, I love you enough to spank you if I need to. I love you enough to discipline you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he disciplines. But he says there uh, a couple things. Moreover, as far as it be, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. It shows you that Samuel was a man of prayer, that he put prayer first. The, the apostles put prayer. If you're, if you're desiring to be a leader, prayer has to be first. The disciples in, in um, Acts chapter six, they devoted themselves to prayer. Um, it says, it says, um, it should not be that we should wait on tables and give up the ministry of prayer and the word. They had to be prayer first. It's prayer first and then the word. So many people want to be teachers and they, they, they want to be strong in the word, but they're not strong in prayer. It's got to be prayer and the word. Prayer and the word. But far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and right way. We need to, we need to follow Samuel's example and be that and maybe God's called you to be an evangelist. Maybe he's called you to be a prophet, pastor, teacher, whatever office gift he may have given you, apostle. We need to walk in it. So tonight, what are you looking for? You came here tonight for something. You think about it. Every single one of you came here tonight for something. Came here because you wanted to see somebody. You came here because you wanted to feel the Lord. You wanted to be touched by the Lord. You want to sing some cool songs. You wanted to see, um, you know, Pastor Dave. You wanted to talk to somebody, you wanted to find a date, you were hoping, you know, whatever, right? You name it. Everybody had a motive for coming here tonight. What are you looking for? Does Jesus want to answer that in himself? Are you looking for something instead of someone to meet your needs? That's the first question. Second thing to think about is, about the Lord's love, that he never runs out. The Lord's love, he never runs out. He never fails. And are you doubting the Lord's love at times? This past week, have you doubted his love? Have you looked back this past month, and there's times where you're just, you're not sure. When you're walking through the dark, don't doubt what God has told you in the light. You hear the, you hear the voice of the Lord. You've read the word. God's word is true. And even though my experience sometimes wrestles with it, My experience is saying this thing, but God's word is saying this thing. What I realize is that my experience is is stilted, is skewed, is twisted. I need to be looking through the eyes of God's word. I need to be understanding it through the word. God, help me to have your vision. God, help me to experience your love and to know it experientially, that I could be set free, that I could walk in that love, and that I could not fear it, that I could not be afraid of it. 
That's the question. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and just close. Maybe in a song like One Thing Remains or whatever they've got. They Actually, they have a couple songs that they can play. You guys can play a couple songs, can't you? <laughs> um, but during this time, take some time with the Lord and ask the Lord, what did you really come for here tonight? What did you come seeking? Did you find it? Did you find him? Let's pray.